Welcome to Aquarium Dog. Subscribe, like, and comment. Hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm back here another video about fish. And that's it. Every time I do one of these episodes, I can't even explain how excited I am to you guys. What ends up happening is that I get that feeling I, you know, we all used to get when there was a field trip at school. The cool thing about it is that I get to experience it every time I go out and shoot some stuff for you guys. So, literally. Conservation should be an integral part of who we are as a human race. The footage you are about to watch and are currently watching was all video recorded by Todd Gardner right here in the New York waters off of our beaches, inlets, and oceans. Our oceans are a home to an extremely extensive intricate biological network of various species that contribute to us as human beings. Our oceans are changing and in many ways negatively. But what can we do? We can help out by decreasing our carbon footprint by making small choices that eventually trickle down and have a positive overall effect on our oceans by volunteering or by contributing to organizations or programs that are making strides in conserving the life of our oceans. There are links and information below in the description to make a donation. Be sure to include the part about the Science Innovation Fund, East Campus, Marine Lab at Suffolk Community College. Comment, like, and subscribe. Hey, what's up guys? Here's another episode of Aquarium Dog. I got a real special guest today, Todd Gardner. I'm gonna show you his lab and what he has here. Here's Todd Gardner. Hey Todd, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I teach uh, marine biology and oceanography and biology here at Suffolk County Community College. This is my marine science labs, our classroom where we have all our marine science classes, do our labs. We got some cool aquaculture projects going on here, raising some gramas, some basslets, uh, who knows what else. Next, next year, uh, we'll be offering a marine aquaculture course. I've always loved fish. I've been keeping fish in tanks since I was six years old. Um, I grew up on an island, Long Island. And um, so I would go down to the beach and, and fill buckets of fish and bring them home and put them in fish bowls. And uh, then I remember the day I caught my first seahorse, then I was really into uh, keeping marine tanks. That was, uh, I guess, about third grade, I caught my first seahorse. And I've had saltwater tanks nonstop ever since. I've worked at uh, fish hatcheries and pet stores. Uh, I've worked at the Long Island Aquarium for 11 years. And I've been teaching here for about 10 years. Now uh, I'm full-time here. And uh, this is where I get my whole fish fix here in this classroom. I have a whole variety of fish in this room uh, from around Long Island and from around the world. Uh, but a few of the ones that we're working with right now are the flathead perch, Rainfordia opercularis, and Grama dejongi, uh, the recently discovered uh, Dijong Grama endemic to Cuba. All fish are important to me, but um, some of the ones we're working with specifically, the flathead perch over here, they've never been raised in captivity before. Uh, the very first time was right here in this room last summer. And uh, we've got some babies here from that batch, and uh, they're uncommon in the wild and very, very rare in captivity, so they're worth a lot of money. Uh, so it's important for the industry to get fish like this captive bred and, and out there into the industry. And so part of uh, what I'm trying to do here is get my students involved in uh, the process of figuring out how to raise some of these new species. And then along the way, we have the opportunity to look at their whole life cycle, their whole larval development, which was never known before this. No one ever even saw the early larval stages of this fish uh, until we raised them here and started putting out photos of them online. Um, we have some other fish uh, over there, the Grama dejongi, 
um, also never raised in captivity before, and um, very difficult to get. They're, they're, they're endemic to Cuba, which makes them impossible to get in the United States, but we got a special permit to import six of them. And uh, recently they started spawning, and we have some of the larvae from them. They're just starting to come through their larval period and settle out, and we have now uh, the very first captive bred Grama de Jongai in the world right here in this room. Well, especially with the flathead perch, uh, the biggest challenge is since no one's ever raised it before, uh, there's nothing I can read to find out what's known about how long the larval period lasts, how large they're going to be when they hatch out, what they need to eat as a first food. So uh, it's kind of taking shots in the dark uh, and, and drawing from my own experience raising other closely related species. Um, and it took uh, months of hatching larvae and watching them die before I ever got any to survive beyond the first couple of weeks. Um, and uh, it's, it was a slow process. Um, the biggest challenge I think with, with any larva, once you know what to feed it, is that you have to keep it in a tank with virtually no filtration for its whole larval period. And there's a lot of larvae and you put in a lot of food, copepods and phytoplankton, and it's very difficult to maintain water quality when you can't easily do big water changes or have a power filter running on it because the larvae are part of the plankton. They'll get sucked up and filtered out. So it's, it's a challenge to filter a larval rearing tank. Um, the larvae and all of their food are alive and they're part of the plankton. They're very small. So if I have a filter hooked up, it's gonna, it's gonna filter out the food, maybe filter out the larvae, um, and, and even if I can work out filtration that, that cleans the water but leaves the fish alone, um, then it's, it's going to be taking their food out. I have to grow all the food that I put in there. So if I'm filtering out food for the larvae, then uh, I have to grow more food to put back in. If I work out something to recapture the food, then I'm putting detritus and dirt back into the tank with that recaptured food. So. Uh, it's a real challenge, and the longer the larval period lasts, uh, the bigger challenge it is. Contaminants creep into the tank. Hydroids and parasites and nice warm, nutrient-rich water and light on it. It's like the perfect environment for growing so many different kinds of marine life. Things just want to grow in there, and most of the things we don't want. We want to have our larvae and the food to feed them. And, uh, and we're providing an environment that's ideal for lots of other things that we don't want in there. So, so keeping the larval tank contaminant free and high water quality and enough food to feed these little larvae, it's, it's really, it's like a little uh, engineering project that uh, nobody's really worked out great solutions to yet. So, and, and each time we tackle a new species, uh, we don't know exactly what faces us yet. These are some of the problems that I'm trying to work out here. favorite fish. Favorite fish? It's like asking a mother who her favorite child is, right? As far as larvae to work with, I really love uh, some of the small groupers and basslets with uh, their long flowing filaments they have in the larval stages. Um, they're, they're very challenging. Those long filaments create uh, a problem, an entanglement problem when you have a bunch of them in a tank. Uh, but it's just really cool watching them pull these, these long filaments around and try and figure out what their function is. Favorite fish in general? I mean, who doesn't love angelfish and triggerfish, right? I haven't had an opportunity to work with many of them, but right now I have some of my first angelfish larvae um, in a, a rearing tank here from the Interruptus angels, and uh, hoping to tackle that one this summer. I think the coolest group of animals on Earth have to be the cephalopods, the octopus and squid, nautilus, cuttlefish. Um, and uh, just their ability to change color, mimic their surroundings. Uh, they're such effective predators. They have such a, a diversity of 
different kinds of defenses and prey capture mechanisms. Uh, it's got to be my favorite animal group. I also love carnivorous plants. I have a carnivorous plant garden at home, a terrarium upstairs full of Venus flytraps and pitcher plants and sundews. Um, it's another one of my hobbies that I also bring into the classroom in some of my biology classes here. Um, I like corals, but I think mostly they make a nice backdrop for my fish. Uh, um, uh, I, I think they're interesting. We talk about them here in class. I probably have uh, a couple of dozen species in the classroom. But my real love uh, as far as marine life here in the classroom has to be uh, the fishes and, and raising their larvae, trying to figure out ways to raise new species. The oceans, if I could, I would uh, spend all my time out in the water. Part of the reason I spend so much time, and I think this is true of a lot of hobbyists, part of the reason uh, I spend so much time taking care of marine life in tanks is that I have to spend so much of my time inside. And I, if I had my way, you know, if, I, if I had my preference, I'd be out on the ocean all the time instead, and I wouldn't keep anything in tanks. But I'm stuck inside, I have fish tanks. I think my most important job here is to educate my students about the importance of the oceans. More than half of the oxygen produced in our atmosphere that's available for us to breathe comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. More than half of the carbon dioxide that we put out, both from respiration and from burning fossil fuels, gets absorbed by the ocean. And uh, so it's really important to the, the ecology and the composition of our atmosphere and to our whole planet. Uh, and we're changing it. Humans are changing the face of the earth. We're changing the surface of the earth, the composition of our atmosphere, uh, and we're changing the biodiversity of the oceans by overfishing and by uh, being careless with garbage and by using it as a dumping ground. Um, and if more people understood the importance of our oceans to the well-being of our whole planet, I think they would make more informed decisions about the things they buy and the way they live their life.